Hello. I know it's been a while, but welcome back all the same to the Umphalos Cafe's ongoing episode-by-episode episode synopsis of James Joyce's monumentally misunderstood classic, Ulysses. We've got lots to cover today, folks. We're at episode 9, back with Stephen, so brace yourselves. Why? Well, by the age of 22, where his alter ego Stephen is at in the book, James Joyce had read massively and widely. Because of that, many of his observations and experiences are filtered through the lens of his readings, making the chapters focusing on Stephen tough sledding indeed. In episode 9, his poetic flights and associations, and spe especially on top of the three whiskeys he drank earlier at lunch, are slightly scattered and are definitely tough going for the average reader. But take heart and look at it this way. Think of all the scholars that have made handsome careers out of trying to decipher the vagaries of Stephen's thoughts. However, the irony of all that weighty scholarship is that in the course of Ulysses, the sort of literary analysis, overthinking, theorizing, constructing, and deconstructing, exactly what Stephen is muddling through in this episode, is precisely what he is striving to transcend, to leave behind. In a word, in Ulysses, the young 22-year-old James Joyce slash Stephen Dedalus is ditching everything from his past in order to discover what is alive and real and true in his and all of our lives. That means, and this may seem harsh, but it is necessary, all his old friends as we see in episode 1 and his relationship with Buck Mulligan, his family as we see throughout the book, the customs of his time of Dublin and Ireland, the British colonial rule and Roman Catholic Church's spiritual tyranny, the entire system of beliefs which shackle people to the past, and as we see in episode 9 here, Stephen is ditching even literature and poetry past and present. There's a beautiful line towards the end when Stephen has nearly exhausted himself with words. It comes after he's already despaired to himself, what the hell are you driving at? I know, shut up, blast you, I have reasons. Amplius, ad hoc, iterum, pustia, are you condemned to do this? Shortly after that, the book reads, he laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. He laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. It seems to me a great many academics and would-be scholars out there could use a little laughter in their lives. Also, that line reminds me of a similar striver, much older than Stephen, but in the same paralytic distress, Harry Haller in Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf. In both cases, laughter represents the great emancipator. In truth, in creating all of these Joycean videos here at the cafe, the one element I regret not being able to incorporate sufficiently is laughter. Although the entire enterprise, this thumbing my nose at a hundred years of scholarship and academic short-sightedness, fills me with joy and laughter. What could be more fun than trumpeting a big raspberry towards several generations of ponderous pundits and be absolutely correct in the process? What do I mean by that? Well, in case you've been hiding under a rock these last few years, and in a poetic sense, most of us are either hiding under or trapped beneath the massive inanimate stone of dead preconceptions and learning that hinders our growth. Here at the cafe, Ulysses is not merely a modern day retelling of Homer's Odyssey, but the continuation and culmination of Joyce's own growth towards world citizenship, artistry, and shamanism. Wow, rewind that last one to mull over and savor a moment or two. Done? Okay, listen to a line from early in a portrait of the artist as a young man. It goes, he turned the flyleaf of the geography and read what he had written there himself, his name and where he was. It says, Stephen Dedalus, class of elements, Clongos Wood College, Salinas, County Kildare, Ireland, Europe, the world, the universe. That's Stephen Dedalus, a.k.a. James Joyce at what? Ten years old? Twelve? Prophetic stuff. And that last bit, Ireland, Europe, the world, and the universe, is the metaphorical road he is traversing in Ulysses. And what's more, the last book he will write, Finnegan's Wake, is written from the perspective of the world and the universe. Now where did all that come from, you might ask? Well, 
it's all through Ulysses. If only we have the eyes to see. If only we can remove the Homeric parallel blinders we all seem saddled with. At any rate, let's move along here. But before I go any further, let me read to you a short piece a guy named Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, or Goethe, as people who know how to pronounce things properly might say. He was 60 when he wrote these lines and reminiscing of the first awakenings of his poetic soul so many years before. He wrote, the first propensities to love in an uncorrupted youth take altogether a spiritual direction. Nature seems to desire that one sex may by the senses perceive goodness and beauty in the other. And so, by the sight of this girl and by my strong inclination for her, a new world of the beautiful and the excellent was revealed to me. It's beautiful, isn't it? Now let me read to you a couple paragraphs from James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Here, the young Stephen Dedalus is walking the beach, where we'll find him strolling and ruminating again a couple years later, within the pages of Ulysses, episode 3. The first bit appears a page or two before the passage I want to share, but I thought it highly illustrative of Stephen's, and indeed, the artist's plight in general. And as an aside, it serves as something of a response to the erudite comment rejecting my contention that Stephen was referring to life when he earlier quipped, that he was a servant of three masters, the king, the pope, and another who wanted him for odd jobs. The quote goes, <clears throat> he's walking the beach. The end he had been born to serve, yet did not see, had led him to escape by an unseen path, and now it beckoned to him once more, and a new adventure was about to be opened to him. Sorry, I have to read that one again because it pretty much sums up what's taking place in Ulysses. It goes, The end he had been born to serve, yet did not see, had led him to escape by an unseen path, and now it beckoned to him once more, and a new adventure was about to be opened to him. Isn't life full of wonder? Anyway, back to a portrait. Listen to this. He was alone. He was unheeded happy and near to the wild heart of life. He was alone and young and willful and wild-hearted, alone amid a waste of wild air and brackish waters and the sea harvest of shells and tangle and veiled gray sunlight and gay-clad, light-clad figures of children and girls and voices childish and girlish in the air. A girl stood before him in midstream, alone and still, gazing out to sea. She seemed like one whom magic had changed into the likeness of a strange and beautiful seabird. Her long, slender, bare legs were delicate as a crane's, and pure save for where an emerald trail of seaweed had fashioned itself as a sign upon her flesh. Her thighs, fuller and soft-hued as ivory, were bared almost to the hips, where the white fringes of her drawers were like feathering of soft white down. Her slate blue skirts were kilted boldly about her waist and dovetailed behind her. Her bosom was as a bird's, soft and slight, slight and soft as the breast of some dark plumaged dove, but her long fair hair was girlish and girlish and touched with the wonder of mortal beauty, her face. Then he goes on. Heavenly God, cried Stephen's soul in an outburst of profane joy. He turned away from her suddenly and set off across the strand. His cheeks were aflame, his body was aglow, his limbs were trembling. On and on and on he strode, far out over the sands, singing wildly to the sea, crying to greet the advent of the life that had cried to him. Again, isn't it beautiful? Do you see the parallels, the similarities in the two passages from Goethe, Goeth, and Joyce? Do I even need to ask? that the two men are describing precisely the same moment of awakening to the wonder and beauty of this world is hard to deny, wouldn't you say? And we're not talking merely literature, folks. We're talking about two very unique souls, ghosts and Joyce's, sharing with us as best they can a moment of their awakening, the surging up of life from the depths of their beings into the light of their emotional and spiritual world. Anyway, let's get back to dirty, sometimes squalid, fixed and stuck fast Dublin and episode 9. Get my glasses back on. The chapter begins, Urbane, 
to comfort them, the Quaker library in Perd, and we have, have we not, those priceless pages of Wilhelm Meister, a great poet on a great brother poet, a hesitating soul taking arms against a sea of troubles, torn by conflicting doubts, as one sees in real life. A typically abrupt chapter launch, and as one sees in real life. I love that. Now, ostensibly, the Quaker librarian is talking about pages on Hamlet, another troubled and struggling poet character, in the largely autobiographical Willem Meister by, again, Johann von Goethe. But this being Joyce's Ulysses, everything is resonating on different levels, amplifying currents at work in our three principal characters, Stephen, Bloom, and Molly. All the songs sung and quotes quoted all the references to works of art harmonize deeply with the seemingly incidental occurrences taking place on the surface. Contrary to what many who should know better teach concerning Joyce's masterwork, there isn't a word in the book out of place, folks. It's all there, tightly woven into a beautiful, harmonic, poetic whole. He says, the Quaker librarian said anyways, a great poet on a great brother poet. A hesitating soul taking arms against the sea of troubles, torn by conflicting doubts, as one sees in real life. And that, folks, is Stephen slash the young 22-year-old James Joyce to a T. Anyway, I have one more quote for you. This one's from pages dedicated to Goethe in Will Durant's incredible 11-volume Story of Civilization. On the subject of Wilhelm Meister, Will Durant writes... Lerjur, learning years, express the period of apprenticeship in the German guilds. Through that time of tutelage, Wilhelm became Meister, master. So the meandering theme of the novel is Wilhelm's slow and painful apprenticeship in the guild of life. Slow and painful pr apprenticeship in the guild of life. I love that. And to borrow those eloquent words, folks, here at the cafe at any rate, the meandering theme of Ulysses is Stephen slash James Joyce's own slow and painful apprenticeship in the Guild of Life. Man, oh man, the associations are piling up, aren't they? Anyway, you want a book to help you understand what is really going on in Ulysses? I'll give you one. Not Hamlet or the Odyssey or any of those other long dead classics academia continually trots out. The truth is, folks, academia doesn't really have a clue. And the irony is Joyce says precisely that in Ulysses with his characters Haynes and Professor McHugh. They, representing the academia of 1904, don't get the 22-year-old Stephen slash James Joyce. But what's really sad to say, sad for the legion of young hungry souls, that is, who file into classrooms and lecture halls today, 114 years later, like lambs to the psycho-spiritual slaughter, is they still don't get them. Folks, you can write that one down, like lambs to the psycho-spiritual slaughter. It's a good one. Anyway, I suppose as the saying goes, some things never change. You want a book to read? Read Irving Stone's Lust for Life, the story of Vincent Van Gogh. And while doing so, understand that the young Vincent in his early 20s is undergoing the same trials as Stephen is undergoing in Ulysses. Unfortunately for Vincent, he had the added, almost insurmountable obstacles of a minister father and a highly successful art-dealing uncle. Not only couldn't he make a full break from the heavy weight of middle-class respectability, as Stephen is in the process of doing in Ulysses, but he never quite found that one friend on the outside, and perhaps just as important, that one woman, as the young James Joyce will find in Nora Barnacle. This is powerful stuff, folks and yet really so simple when you get down to it. All right, finally, in episode nine, we find ourselves in Ireland's National Library, its temple of literature and poetry, if you will, and Stephen is expounding his long-awaited theory on Shakespeare's Hamlet. Only, he's drank three whiskeys earlier with the pressman from episode seven, and what's more important to understand, his heart's no longer in the exercise. He's been doing it for years, clarifying his thoughts and his theories to anyone who will listen. His brother, his mother, Cranley, Mulligan, all have served at various times as sounding boards as he worked out his ideas. But now, those ideas and theories simply don't seem to matter anymore. Surveying the books on the shelves around him, he thinks, coffined words, dead matter. Now, folks, 
would be poets and artists because in truth those are the souls the cafe is actually addressed to. This is an important point which naturally academics and scholars would vehemently disagree with. But the truth is books are inanimate objects, dead matter. Even this book, Ulysses, is dead, like a seashell cast up on a shore. With paper, binding, print, words and images, it's evident that at some point in the past life touched and molded the material comprising it, but the book itself is dead. Don't revere it. Don't put it up on a pedestal and kneel before it. Reveal the life that fashioned it. If you cannot look out into the street and see life, see what Stephen slash Joyce spent seven years striving to capture between the covers of this book, if you cannot feel it coursing through your own heart and veins, you're not going to get what is really going on here. Just as Stephen said seemingly offhandedly to Mr. Deasy in episode two, pointing out into the yard where the kids were playing, that is God, Stephen said. Life is out in the street, not in a book. Anyway, I won't go into the details of Stephen's Hamlet disquisition. I'll leave that to you. The chapter is actually quite painful to read at times. As I said, Stephen's heart isn't in it, and even when asked towards the end if he, if he believed in his theories, he promptly replies, no. His two principal listeners, John Eglinton and A.E. Russell, seem to represent the state of contemporary literature and poetry of the day. Later, Buck Mulligan turns up and Stephen isn't happy. No one is really listening anyways, and all along, Bloom, on the trail of his key's advertisement, is a presence in the background. It seems there's a sort of literary gathering happening that evening, but while Mulligan and even Haynes are invited, Stephen pointedly is not, which doesn't really bother him because he wouldn't have shown up anyways. Why? Because he, as was the James Joyce at 22, was done with the literature of his day, finished. Talk, as the saying goes, is cheap. The time had come in his life to move on. The challenge was what to move on to. And that's where Stephen is at this painful point in his development. With everything now from his past dead and behind him, what is there to move towards? What is vital and real in life, as he's asked himself repeatedly? Is there anything in Dublin left for him? Anything at all his foundering soul can turn towards? It doesn't seem like it, does it? And with that, let me read to you from the final pages of the chapter. Mulligan and Stephen are leaving the library, but all that Mulligan represents for Stephen is dead and finished, and he quickly considers ditching his old friend. Towards the end of the chapter, we read, About to pass through the doorway, feeling one behind, he stood aside. Part. The moment is now. Where then? If Socrates leave his house today, if Judas go forth tonight, why? That lies that lies in space, which I in time must come to, ineluctably. My will, his will, he's talking about Mulligan here, that fronts me, sees between. A man passed out between them, bowing, greeting. Good day again, Buck Mulligan said, the portico. Here I watch the birds for augury, Angus of the birds. They go, they come. Last night I flew, easily flew. Men wondered, street of harlots after, a cream fruit melon he held to me. In, you will see. The wandering Jew, Buck Mulligan whispered, because he's talking about Bloom, who was the man that passed between Stephen and Mulligan. Now, what is all that about? Last night I flew, street of harlots, the cream fruit melon he held to me. What the heck is he talking about? More seeming Joycean non sequiturs? More games and puzzles you might at first glance think? But wait. Like I said, there's nothing out of place here, folks. Let's go back to episode 3 on the beach along Sandy Mount Strand and see Stephen is ruminating on a great many things. In episode 3, the book reads, After he woke me up last night, same dream, or was it? Wait. Open hallway, street of harlots, remember, Harun al-Rashid, I am all mosting it. That man led me, spoke, I was not afraid. The melon he had, he held against my face, smiled, cream fruit smell. That was the rule, said, in, come, red carpet spread. You will see who. Do you see that? Those thoughts from his dream of the night before in episode 3 are triggered again in episode 9 by Bloom passing, and this is significant between he and Mulligan. 
That is, Stephen has actually dreamt of meeting Bloom the night before. Everything in Dublin is dying within him, but he has dreamt of Bloom, of not being afraid and close to him, of the street of harlots and a red carpet welcoming spread. Now, you might ask, how could he have dreamt of meeting Bloom? What kind of magic or occult might be involved in that? But as we learn in the question and answer chapter later on, Stephen and Bloom have actually met on two or three occasions. And once, when Stephen was 10 years old and in the company of his mother, he even invited Bloom back to the Daedalus household, which Bloom respectfully declined. That Stephen, who spends his days and nights wandering the streets of Dublin, at the very least unconsciously, would be aware of the itinerant Bloom, the outsider, the man who his own wife Molly describes as not like anyone else, isn't a stretch, folks. And that's it for episode 9, a sort of end of the past and everything in Dublin for the young Stephen slash James Joyce, and you might say, the seed of something new. As always, Thanks for visiting the O'Fallows Cafe. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.